In August 1793, Parisian citizens who sympathized with the revolution gathered for a special event. At this time, revolutionaries ruled over the new French Republic, founded exactly one year ago. To celebrate the anniversary, the revolutionaries came up with something special. A journey through Paris consisting of various symbolic stages. The old emblems of the monarchy were burned at the Place de la Révolution. Actresses were sitting on cannons at the Boulevard Poissonnière, portraying the heroes of the revolution. And a statue of the Egyptian goddess Isis, with water springing from her breasts, was built on the ruins of the Bastille. The monument was called the Fountain of Regeneration, and the statue of the goddess represented nature, fertility and rebirth. Eighty-six male participants were selected to drink the water from the fountain, which symbolized national renewal. The celebrations went on as planned. The only thing that made some of the men uncomfortable was the presence of women at these political events who wanted to be more than mere spectators. They too wanted to be real citizens of the new republic and not limit themselves to their motherly role. Yet their desire for political participation was not fulfilled, and they had to witness how the figure of the strident Marianne was replaced by the motherly goddess. One month after the celebrations, the president of the Paris Commune, Pierre Bascar Chomet, held a speech at a city hall condemning the political activities of women. Since when is it permitted to abandon one's sex? Since when is it decent for a woman to forsake the pious care of their households and the cribs of their children, coming instead to public places to hear speeches in the galleries and senate? Is it to man that nature confided domestic cares? Has she given us breasts to feed our children? Schumet stated that, by giving woman breasts, nature decided that their natural habitat is the domestic sphere. Therefore, the woman in the city hall should take off their red liberty caps, stop playing Marianne, and return to their houses. Just 35 years before Chomet used the female breast to argue for stripping women of all political power, famed taxonomist Carl Linnaeus used it to construct a new class of animals. In 1758, Linnaeus introduced the class of Mammalia, which is Latin for of the breast. The historian Londa Skivinger reconstructs the historical and political context of Linnaeus' work in her essay why Mammals Are Called Mammals from 1993. She shows that Linnaeus did not only intend to restructure the animal kingdom, but also European society. There are many ways to categorize animals. They can be identified with the elements, animals of the air, animals of the sea and so on, or by an apparent feature such as the ones with hair, the ones with scales and so on. Today, most scientists do not believe that there is one true taxonomy. Carl Linnaeus, however, believed that God created all species and endowed them with the ability to procreate similar entities. There is an original set of well-defined species. The artificial categorizations of man can be perfected and eventually uncover the original plan of the Creator. And Linnaeus tried to do exactly that by writing his famous Systema Nature. Carl Linnaeus lived in the 18th century when European missionaries, colonizers, explorers, scientists and conquerors gathered vast amounts of data from all over the world. Data management became indispensable and, at the same time, an increasingly stressful endeavor. All of the new knowledge blew up the classical Aristotelian system and biologists had difficulties creating a new taxonomy. New animals such as the platypus caused fierce controversy among zoologists. On top of that, they had to answer the challenging question of how to integrate man into the system of nature. Linnaeus divided animals into six groups, Mammalia, Avis, Amphibia, Piscus, Insect and Vermis. Here Mammalia sticks out, while the other five categories can be traced back to the Aristotelian classifications, Mammalia is entirely new and does not draw on any tradition. It is the only category used for animals that focuses on reproductive organs. 
And it is also remarkable that mammals share other standard features such as hair or the aortic arc bending to the left. So the fact that Linnaeus assigned these animals to the same group is not surprising when we look at the history of taxonomy and the empirical features these animals share. But why was the breast chosen to be the main characteristic? The category could also have been named the hollow-eared ones, the hairy ones or the ones with three ear bones. Nipples are primarily identified with breastfeeding, and the question of why men and many male animals have nipples has been around for a long time. Some scholars, such as Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's grandfather, referred to the platonic myth of an original hermaphroditic being that split into man and woman at one point. Another one of the more popular answers was that males were actually capable of producing milk, but that this only happened in exceptional circumstances. As proof, scientists cited anecdotes they knew from hearsay. For example, the famous explorer Alexander von Humboldt wrote in his journals that a man in Venezuela nurtured his son for three months while his wife was ill. Charles Darwin himself later suggested that, at an earlier age, Male mammals aided females in nurturing their children. In this state of uncertainty, it is unlikely for a taxonomist to build an important category on such shaky grounds. To explain this oddity, we will have to look closer at the tradition of Aristotelian taxonomy and the social and political context of the works of Linnaeus. In ancient Greece and Rome, the ideal female breast was supposed to be relatively small spherical and unused. In ancient Greek philosophy, the sphere was the most perfect of all shapes, and the dwelling of the milk-bearing breast was deforming it. Upper-class women from antiquity to early modern times gave their children to wet nurses to avoid a longer deformation of their breasts and the burden of having to suckle their children. At the end of the 18th century, up to 90% of upper- and middle-class women in Paris gave their children to wet nurses. These nurses usually came from poorer families, lived outside the city and took the children into their homes. For various reasons this led to an increase of infant mortality. Against this tradition a movement emerged with famous advocates such as Linnaeus and the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Linnaeus wrote a pamphlet against wet nursing entitled Step Nurse. Here he claimed that wet nursing was an act against nature. It was unnatural and unhealthy for a mother of a newborn baby to force her milk back into her body, as Linnaeus described it. Moreover, wet nursing would lead to higher infant mortality and degeneration of the children. He claimed the mother's milk of the inferior classes and races had concerning effects on upper-class children and could even be the cause for the manifestation of bad habits in later years, such as alcoholism. And the philosopher Rousseau preached that mothers deign to nurse their children, morals will reform themselves, nature's sentiments will be awakened in every heart, the state will be repeopled. In the 19th century the movement gained even more momentum. The natural family was reinvented. Middle class mothers were urged to cut all the intermediaries between them and their children. Wet nurses, servants and private tutors were considered dangerous to their children's moral and physiological well-being. A middle-class woman was supposed to care for her child in three ways. Good mothers ensured the quality of the child's genes by marrying a healthy husband of the same race. They prevented abnormal behaviors, particularly masturbation, and they prevented degeneration by shielding the child from too much contact with the lower classes and races. More than ever should middle class women limit their activities solely to the domestic sphere. New laws were enacted that limited women's ability to pursue activities outside the household and prevented them from making important decisions on their own, such as entering into contracts independently of their husbands. Linnaeus continued this tradition by calling humans homo sapiens and categorizing them as mammals. He tied humans closer to beasts with a characteristic mainly associated with women and he separated humans from nature by calling them rational animals, a quality that was considered primarily a male trait in his time. 
On the one hand, classification is based on the discovery of empirical features and on the other hand, on tradition. By creating the categories of birds, amphibia, fish and so on, Aristotle constructed a taxonomy that would eventually undergo dramatic alterations and paradigm shifts. But it also pre-structured upcoming taxonomies. Discoveries may have led to the invention of new categories, but these were already partly predetermined by the gaps between the already established categories. We are mammals for a political reason, but the meaning of mammal cannot be reduced to that, as there are other reasons why it makes sense to distinguish between mammals and other animals. Today the use of this category has ceased to be a political act, but the history of why we are mammals can teach us much about taxonomy. There will always be categories that are historically contingent and partly chosen for political reasons. And the classifications we choose will always conceal some things and make other things visible. They imply that some things are normal and others are not. That some things are natural while others are unnatural. If we accept that, we can be more cautious about the implications of our taxonomical systems. Since there are no platonic ideas or divine taxonomies, we will never be able to create an ahistorical and apolitical classification system. We are, after all, as Aristotle famously said, political animals.